So this is a pretty complicated paper, as you uh, probably appreciate, so I'll, I'll try and make a, a, a few comments. I think it's a very interesting paper. Um, so it's a great paper that looks at the implications of, of, the, of distortions in the spatial distribution of economic activity, which is sort of at the heart of what a lot of us uh, worry about. Um, while there has been some work sort of trying to look at this in sort of a full GE way, as, um, uh, as uh, Garrett has here um, uh, shown, um, there is not that much work. It's a very complicated GE problem if you really want to think about what are the sort of losses from a spatial misallocation um, of resources. Uh, needless to say that most of whatever literature there is is on developed countries. There's very little uh, work that uh, I could um, think of that would address this problem in a developing country context. I'm going to have three comments uh, on this. Uh, two sort of so that the way uh, this is all backed out on the estimation and one um, final comment on sort of the policy implications of this. What do we learn from this uh, for, for, for policy? <coughs> so the first comment is, is maybe a bit um, uh, convoluted. It's about the amenities. So as Steve has already pointed out here, um, there's a lot of stuff that gets sort of uh, you know, thrown into the amenity uh, bin uh, in this model, if you think about London, you know, London is not a place with very bad amenities. It's a great place in terms of restaurants and lots of other things. It's also a place that pays high nominal wages. However, it has very high real estate prices to bring us back to spatial equilibrium. So here, because there is no real estate, uh, you know, amenities in big cities are going to be terrible because, well, they're very expensive. So there are two bits that go into the amenities. One is sort of high real estate pr uh, prices, which are, I understand, are very hard to measure, and, uh, and amenities. So uh, more specifically, the model implies that an increase in productivity in the location does not increase wages. Yeah? So that's a slightly uh, more technical um, assumption here, which is driven by the Frechet distribution. Um, so any, diff sort of any difference in nominal wages across space uh, is, again, going to be explained by, um, uh, by these amenity difference. This implies that wage difference between cities are all explained with these amenity differences. However, we know that there is a clear correlation between nominal wages and city size. Um, so uh, here, you know, you would um, you would not really be able to capture that. I don't think this matters first order for the results that they are uh, they are interested in. But sort of, I think we should be clear here in our back of our minds that the amenities here capture a large thing, and the model is not going to capture other important first order features of what we know about the spatial distribution of economic activity or the spatial distribution of nominal wages. Okay, let me look more closely um, at the um, sort of the key thing that the uh, paper uh, tries to do, which is sort of Id identifying migration costs. So how costly are these sort of trade barriers for people moving from where they are born to potentially more productive jobs in another uh, location? So the structural identification of migration costs is going to rely on two key pieces of data or two parameters. The first one is this Frechet shape parameter, which is theta, um, which we sort of passed by very quickly early on, which is in turn estimated of wage data. So they're going to be estimates, and I'm going to show the estimates in a moment. Uh, Gara didn't even have time uh, to show those. And you're going to see the observed migration flows between regions. This is sort of very similar to sort of the standard way we inf infer trade costs for goods, in a sort of a structural model where you essentially have to make it take a stance on the elasticity of substitution between goods, so that would be sigma up here, and then you can back out from observed trade flows how high trade barriers have to be to sort of replicate the kind of trade flows that we see. Yeah? So here, the Frechet um, shape parameter intuitively is going to govern, as Garrett has explained, how heterogeneous my, my earnings prospects are in different locations. So, if this fr so it's an inverse measure, if the Frechet parameter is very low, there's a lot of heterogeneity as to how well I'm going to do, how much I'm going to earn in different locations. Um, therefore, the, opportunity, the, sort of, the opportunities of moving in space are very large, whereas if the Frechet pr uh, shape parameter is very, is very large, then these differences in my productivity in different locations are relatively small. Therefore, it doesn't really matter whether I work where I was born or move to some other place. So clearly... Um, so uh, the, the estimate here is going to be critical, and we're going to combine this with the observed flows. Yeah? So if we have a low uh, theta, if we have a low shape parameter, so there's a huge heterogeneity in opportunities, and we see small, uh, small migration flows, we're going to infer that there must be very high costs that prevent people from taking these opportunities. 
Okay, so the estimates of um, that's the wrong one. The estimates of uh, of this uh, critical sort of theta parameter are here. So if you look at Indonesia, um, there's also the correlation which you can ignore here. The, the theta parameter <laughs> slightly increases uh, in Indonesia over time, um, which would mean that heterogeneity in opportunities slightly declines over time. And there's a huge difference between Indonesia and the United States. Yeah? So the estimates would suggest here that the heterogeneity in employment opportunities across different places in the U.S., which are different states, is much smaller. Yeah? So the uh, kind of my question uh, about this is the, you know, the identification of, you know, it's a, they have a reasonable identification of theta, but um, it would be good to know to what extent um, the differences in theta contribute to the differences rather than differences in actual observed migration flows, um, you know, uh, contribute to the difference in migration costs um, that you see in the U.S., uh, and Indonesia, and similarly, to what extent these two factors, i.e. changes in theta and changes in actual migration flows, contribute to the changes over time. Yeah? So we see theta, for example, uh, falls in the U.S. That would be consistent with the increase uh, uh, in, um, in migration costs that you, that you back out. Okay, so that's uh, sort of the, the question here. I, I don't know if, I think it's, you know, it's a very reasonable exercise, but uh, it would be good to know, get, get sort of more of a handle what is really uh, going on here uh, quantitatively. So that in terms of policy implications, the, the key policy question is how governments can reduce the estimated migration costs to achieve better job matches. So the estimated migration costs are, are both correlated with measures of, of uh, so they're both correlated with distance, as you show very clearly. So there's a very clear correlation between the, the, the model estimated migration costs and simple physical distance as you didn't really have time to show, they also correlated with measures of cultural and physical distance between locations. From the trade coast, so my kind of worry here is from the trade coast literature, we know that physical distance is extremely important. So gravity, you know, even to, for, for migration, gravity holds extremely well. For trade flows, it holds uh, very well. It holds for almost everything. So distance matters a great deal. If we try and explain the distance effect um, with actual shipping costs, we can typically only account a very, very small part of the, um, of the distance effect. So distance seems to be important over and above its direct financial costs of shipping people or you know, driving back home to see your parents um, here. So the concern is that before we start sort of building highways as a way to sort of reduce migration costs and improve job matches, uh, it would be good to understand better what is behind this distance effect. Yeah, even after stripping out sort of your proxies for cultural differences, maybe a lot of the remaining distance effect are in the end also other unobserved cultural differences. Yeah? And then obviously, you know, if, if building a road is all that it takes for, for someone to move to this high quality job, then obviously we should build the road. If there are other reasons, you know, I'm just very attached to where I come from because there are huge ethnic differences in the country and it's just very costly for me to move to another part of the uh, country, then obviously the, the policy recommendation of sort of uprooting people and moving them to a more productive job is, is, is not as clear. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for extra points for brevity. Okay. Uh, great. So let's open it up to two questions. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering uh, how you deal with the effects of population growth. I don't know what the situation in Indonesia is, but uh, in Africa, where I've done a bit of work, population growth is around 3% in many countries. In the rural areas, there's this impact on productivity at the margin and indeed on the environment. So the amenity of the rural livelihood is steadily going down. <coughs> and in the urban areas, um, you have both the effect of uh, inbuilt population growth from the existing urban population, plus, and most of migration, I guess, in Indonesia, like in Africa, is from rural to urban, and <clears throat> very little investment in the urban infrastructure, so that both in the rural areas and in the urban areas, you have a sort of steady downward slope in what you've called amenities, although possibly not housing costs. And um, it seems to me that this, this sort of background of population growth which seems to me is, is quite often ignored in the literature, is actually much more important than people uh, give it credit for. 
Yeah, so I think there's something important that we, in some sense, have wrong in the paper, which is I take the agglomeration effect. So as, you know, in the data it looks like as a, as a city becomes denser, it becomes more productive. That's certainly what we see in developed countries, but I don't know that we have enough data to say that that's true in developing countries. So the number I take is, in some sense, uh, a shot in the dark. And one of the things we want to do with this project, which you know, is 10 minutes' work when we get to it, is to look and suppose that it was much lower. Suppose that as people moved into cities in developing countries, it didn't have that strong agglomeration effect. Would that affect this largely? And that to us would be another suggestion that, that, that um, investing in infrastructure, like transportation costs, as Simon was talking about, are very important for having the city function in a developing country as it is in a developed country. So let's suppose we get to the end of this process and we say that if there are strong agglomerations, there are big, important effects of moving people across space, but in the absence of those agglomeration effects, there is no, no effect, then I think we learn something important about policy. The other sense in which I think that we're wrong is, I, is in terms of, of rural areas, we, don't, we can't find what in rural areas well in our data. We have regencies. Not, uh, not rural versus urban areas. So there's not a lot we can do about this. But my, my thinking is it's even... I mean, traditional development economics would suggest that the more people in urban areas, the lower productivity. So in some sense, in those areas, we have exactly the wrong assumption. Um, and, you know, the, being able to do something about that is, 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 you know, this is the right place to ask for. It's about having the data... That, uh, that would allow us to differentiate between the rural and urban areas better. In some sense, this data that we have here, sorry, I'm half in a mic and half out, is, is taken as its 5% sample as an Indonesian census. If we did have the whole census, we can do a better job um, at trying to answer some of these questions. So I do think they're of first order importance. I think that understanding these parameters again, understanding what happens in terms of productivity in rural areas as you push more people in is you know, a first order policy question that's, that's relative, re relevant to people who are interested in urbanisation. Maybe you could say very quickly that it's not the case that it's only one-way migration. It's actually substantial oh, yeah. reverse flows, and then there's also substantial urban-to-urban -urban flows. So additional being born in an urban area, 80% of those guys have then migrate go to another urban area. Uh, and then conditional being born in a rural area, 30% of those guys migrate to another rural area. And you see some deficit as well. So part of the benefit of having a more multidimensional model is that we can capture sort of urban-to-urban -urban flows as well as urban-back-to-rural flows as well. Set. Mushik, you're on. Um, I, there's something simple that I... Uh, one suggestion, one question. The suggestion is something simple you guys I think you could do uh, that will also help you answer some of Daniel's questions is that in the last 15 years or so, there's been substantial increase in private airline industry and operations in uh, Indonesia. It's only six to eight companies. You can easily get data on what routes they operated when, right? and that's going to directly tell you. And, and I think that's probably what explains that the, the increase in numbers that Daniel pointed out. And similarly, on the amenities side, uh, another simple data that one could use is that some movements from one Kajamatan to another would involve movements across islands and mm. movements across language. Right? Uh, you, know, you guys know this from our recent fieldwork, and it's really difficult. You know, not, not everybody in Indonesia speaks Bahasa. So Java's can easily move there. So I didn't show the effects of language, and they are strongly correlated with the movement costs. I can also tell you, we, we haven't got it in the paper, and it's sort of buried in something we did a long time ago, but moving across water massively increases this cost in a way that's sort of more than proportional to the amount of time that that would increase your... Um, your movement cost. Um, there is also um, a, a lovely data set which Paul Gluey and some others have which tells you the quality of roads in Indonesia, which we haven't looked at yet, but which would be a better way, a good way of getting at, at Daniel's question about whether improving the quality of roads really would, uh, would push this down. Stephen. So I had a question about the calibration so, uh, and the counterfactuals. So when you calibrate the model, it doesn't really matter whether amenities are land prices or they're just some exogenous characteristic of the location because I can always solve for a vector of amenities that exactly rationalizes the observed equilibrium. But when you do the counterfactuals, it's going to be really important whether amenities are exogenous or endogenous, right? Because suppose I double the population of London. If amenities are exogenous, you know, there's sort of no effect. If amenities are really land prices and I double the population of London, land prices are going to increase substantially, and that's going to really affect 
the counterfactual predictions of the model. So I think you can capture that in the model because you split amenities into an endogenous and an exogenous component. But what it suggests is that the parameter on the endogenous component could be very interesting for the counterfactuals, and it'd be sort of interesting to see when you play with that parameter, how does it affect the um, impact of changing migration costs, et cetera, in the counterfactuals. It's actually even somewhat more complicated than Stephen, Stephen said. When, when, you, when you think about the endogenous element, rising land values are ones in which there's a, there's a reverse person who's benefiting from that, whereas rising congestion does not actually have a, have a net side on it, which makes it somewhat more, more complicated. But, so you will say that, exactly that point. So. Okay. Yeah, actually, I was going to follow up on that. So um, the other thing you might want to think, so yeah, there's a real resource cost to these, these congestion effects, right, as opposed to these uh, land effects, which are a transfer. But also one thing I'm, I'm kind of deeply suspicious of, so I find in U.S. data that there's not a, a relationship between real incomes and city sizes, right? So that's why that parameter is zero. But I do wonder if in a time with greater pollution and external, negative externalities, whether that parameter used to be, ne used to be negative, uh, and now, you know, Jakarta's, uh, of course, it's much larger, so the pollution uh, is probably much greater, but the elasticity may be weaker than it used to be. And also, perhaps, the excitement of being in a cosmopolitan city uh, might, be, might have grown over time. I'm not sure about that. So, so, so I, I certainly think empirically that in 1970, the relationship between real incomes and city size in the U.S. were strongly positive, and now it's, now it's flat, as, as uh, David said. Just factor in Detroit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so decline, uh, there were negative amenities in, in cities that, that are reduced over time. Yeah, I, I'm, what, what are you thinking about job creation uh, opportunities here? I mean, wh where are these jobs coming from? What's, this what's is going if on? you move, it will arrive. The technical assumption is it's a long-run equilibrium, and we have no idea what happens. I, I think it's a hugely interesting question. There is this nice recent paper by Paula Bustos on, um, on increases in agricultural productivity in Brazil. And, you know, if you believe that work, you, you increase agricultural productivity in, in Brazil and people move into the manufacturing sector and they get jobs. You know, they arrive. And so, I, you know, that's one piece of evidence perhaps suggests that the jobs come, but I, I don't know where they're coming from. I mean, I think that we need sort of the micro-level studies like what, uh, what Simon's doing. Sorry. So predictably, I'll ask, them, I'll ask a bit more about the labor market. Uh, so I assume the model that you're calibrating is using observed wages that you see amongst, amongst the migrants, and I think that you argue that unemployment rates aren't higher amongst migrants in this setting, which may, may be true. So, so, but so, the, so the kind of data that I'm working with you, you'll always just see migrants firstly going through longer transition periods to actually enter the labor market or find jobs. So that's maybe part of the mobility cost. But then also they're far more open to exploitation. So they're working much longer hours, which may have an impact on, on the hourly wage. And also just, just worse jobs with less security, doing harder tasks. So there's some sorting of migrants into the kind of lower quality jobs. So all of that would then be part of your amenity immunity cost of cities, but the point is that it's different between migrants and people who already live in the city, and so I think it's conceptually a little bit, a little bit different uh, if, the, if the quality of the jobs and the hours are, are different. This is an interesting comment, and I actually think we could separate out the amenities on both, because we have the data on those who stay, the proportion that choose to stay versus the proportion that choose to move into every city, and I suspect you could separate them out. But I actually think it's the flip, right? We're finding that migrants are in higher, we have hours and income support rates, so we have an hourly wage, we find that they are in higher hourly wages. So if there are extra many costs, and if anything, we're understating these. Uh, it's also incorrectly not the case that there's any difference in the employment rate that we get from these data between migrants and non-migrants. So the unemployment rate in the city is around about 7%. There's a little difference between people who are born there versus immigrants. Uh, but in terms of what we see in hourly wages, the guys that are coming in are getting paid more this is also a partial response to your first comment, Daniel, which is actually you will get the city size average wage effect because cities that are highly productive will import a lot of migrants. And migrants in the model always get paid more, and migrants in the data always get paid more. So in some sense, we would explain a city size wage gap just by the fact that there are more migrants, which may be not your first order thought of why it happens, but it's sort of something that, that the model throws up. Class. So I actually think, uh, you know, the, the benefit from uh, reducing uh, mobility costs to the level of the U.S., this 50%, that's actually 
quite big, right? I mean, it's an order of magnitude bigger than the types of effects that people find from uh, trade integration, for example. So I, I, I felt you downplayed that a little bit because you compared it with the 15-fold uh, difference in, in GDP. I think that's quite substan substantial. But then the question becomes, uh, you know, what are the costs of actually getting uh, to the level of mobility we see in the U.S. And I was kind of intrigued by something Melanie said, which is when you talk about misallocation, for example, if it's rural-urban misallocation, then, you know, if everybody moves into these rural uh, urban areas, you have to build all that urban infrastructure. But if, it, but if it's misallocation of saying people are in the wrong city and you just kind of have to reshuffle people, but the overall distribution of uh, uh, the sizes of the different locations is not really what's driving the misallocation, then you may not have to build any infrastructure. So it would be very interesting to see in your paper uh, and disentangle, you know, what, what is actually happening to the size distribution of locations when you, for example, reduce uh, the mobility cost uh, to the level of the U.S. Yeah, okay. uh, so one thing about that is that I think what we want to make the point is that you know people study a lot the effect, for example, of roads on trade integration, and they backed out this. If it's the case that, for example, building roads also facilitates labor movement, this is going to be another benefit that we may not be counting. So if anything, what we can say is to get these cost-benefit analyses, what we should be adding in is any aggregate effects of reallocating people. And so, for example, uh, using sort of the natural experiment in Brazil with the new capital city and the highway location there, we show that. This does change the where people are migrating to, and you can decompose how much of the cost across space is the fact that they now have easier access to highways versus just geographical differences. If it's the case that the road was worth building without counting for this, this is going to be an additional benefit that you get by this that people are maybe are not counting at the moment. But I think doing some of these uh, cost benefit analyses, we can definitely try to put some benchmark numbers on this. In terms of the quantitative sizes, I mean, I think our comparison in saying that this is not a huge effect is looking at the rest of the misallocation literature, where a lot of people have claimed really very, very large effects. So if we think that, you know, misallocation in manufacturing explains 50% or, or thereabouts of, of the difference in TFP between China and, uh, and the US, then, then this is small. Although, granted, this is not TFP. So what we have thought about is turning this into a TFP number, which would potentially be a larger number. Yeah, in a low growth setting, especially if manufacturing sector is stagnant, you observe a lot of rural urban migration. Could it not be because of the liquidity constraints in the rural areas or security issues in, in rural areas? So are we not better off looking at interventions in the rural areas rather than the urban areas? I think this is uh, the question that I would like most to answer. Uh, I, I mean, I will say that you have to contend with a couple of facts, which is, one is, of the, the sort of studies that exist of people moving between rural and urban areas, there is always, in the country that every country I've seen, a big increase in wages. And, you know, there are these persistent average wage gaps between people living in urban and rural areas, which means that the people who move across space are have seeing an increase in their welfare, and they wouldn't be moving if they weren't seeing an increase Nominal in their welfare. Wages, not real wages. Yes. Yep. Granted. Yep. Um, I mean, in some sense, the one, only data point I have on this is that, you know, in the stuff we did in Bangladesh, it's not only that people see a big increase in their nominal wages. There we're studying um, seasonal migration, and we can see that they continue to move over and over again uh, over years. And so the fact that people stay in cities is suggestive of, of real wage increases uh, as well. Um, but I, I, I mean, I, I'm ag agnostic on this point, whichever it is, I, I, I think it's... Well, so. I raise this because it's a very contentious issue in many mm -hmm. developing countries where you end up spending scarce public resources. Yeah. Uh, One of the things that... So Melanie Mushvik and I are trying to replicate experiments on, on, on people moving across space and their outcomes uh, on their wages and, uh, and on their lives. 
uh, across many different places. One of the things we're interested in is, is it the case that I can find places where uh, the manufacturing industry is stagnant and therefore I can't move people across space and have their, 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 their wages increase? So, you know, IGC is the right place to think about this. Uh, if, if, there are, if there are places where we can run these sorts of experiments and try and answer this question, could we work out where it is that we're better off doing work in rural areas and where we're better off subsidizing people moving into urban areas? That's exactly what we want to do. To <laughs> uh, Marcel, for the last, for the last question. Yes, uh, you talked about uh, some of the policy implication in terms of uh, reducing transport costs. But I, my impression, I'm not, I'm not a specialist of Indonesia by any means, but my impression was that uh, the government did try to emphasize movement of population and, uh, in fact, uh, especially to reduce population pressure in Java, so they basically encouraged the movement of, of Javanese to Sumatra and Borneo and all those places, and not necessarily of Sumatra people to Borneo and so on. So is there anything there you could uh, go a little, you know, dig a little deeper to see whether this policy had any effect on your estimates? Yeah, so we are aware of the policy in principle. Okay, so the, the movement costs as we back them out rely on the symmetry of movement costs, costs across space. If you move from A to B, it's the same cost as moving from B to A. This policy reduces the cost of moving one way from A to B, and it's, it's, it's out into the islands. So it won't show up in our estimates in terms of what the movement costs are. So where is it going to show up? It's going to show up as if there's a sudden increase in the amenity of living out into rural areas in, in Indonesia, um, in which are, from our understanding, what we've looked at, the lower productivity areas. So they're sort of going to increase uh, misallocation, but we certainly should try and look at what they are better. Wonderful. And on that note, let's thank, uh, let's thank the... the